The show is crap. I don't know what to do about it yet. Perfect. Yeah. Welcome to our Fem Freak recap of Star Trek Discovery. I am Anita and I'm joined by Ebony. That's right. We're here to talk about episode number three. We are. And we are in the same room looking at each other. Well, I'm looking at Ebony. She's not looking at me. No, I'm looking at my copious notes that I took for the show. There's a lot of notes. To there are a lot of one. notes and there are arrows. There are rankings. There are things that are circled things that I want to make sure we get to. So let's get it started. All right. Cue yeah. the music. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a theme song yet. I mean, That's for season two. Are you going to sing it? Sing what? The theme, the song? theme song? I haven't come up with one yet. This show is crap. I don't know what to do about it yet. Perfect. Yeah. Done. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So uh, we recapped episodes one and two last week, and this episode um, starts six months after the events of episode two. Yeah. Michael Burnham mm -hmm. is a mutineer. Yeah. She got sentenced to life. Mm -hmm. And this opens up with her on a uh, transport vessel. This bogus ass prison transport. Listen. There's no security on this prison transport, which is basically like a Greyhound bus in space. There's just the pilot. And then when something goes wrong, the pilot leaves the ship and gets blown off into space with like that space dust. I wanted to laugh so hard. What the fuck? I asked that question 17 times in the first 10 minutes of this episode, of the last two episodes. But this one especially because I was just like, who is behind this? Why is no one thinking? This makes no sense. It's so bad. Look, I, I, this, <laughs> yes, this show is so bad. Like, I don't even, I don't even want to dignify my time by like actually going through this section by section. Like I, it just, okay. She's on the shuttle. Mm -hmm. All the shit happens. And then boom, boom, boom. A big no, wait, 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 to wait. I told the people. Um, that I was going to talk about Burnham's hair oh, in every right. episode. So I want to talk about that. Let's talk about how she got rid of that bulk and bob and got that bomb set of curls. It's I was very, very pleased because I was like, yes, this is the future. You, could, you can tell she's getting her prison ration of shea butter because that shit was moisturized. <laughs> Those curls were defined. She looked impeccable. So Ebony's hair chat for week three, thumbs up. Perfect. Yes. Okay, but can we actually, one thing I started thinking about while we were watching this was... Tell me, Anita. I know that too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that, like, okay, we've got our first woman of color as the star of a Star Trek show mm -hmm. or a movie, mm -hmm. and she's a fucking prisoner? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know why it just dawned on me, but it just dawned on me, and, like, she's in, you know, prisoner garb, and she's, like, everyone hates her, and they're scowling mm -hmm. at her, and I'm like, that... I'm I'm less um uh, um less unsettled by that fact than the fact that this is the most military show in Star Trek history. So the fact that she's a prisoner, yes, you know, I I, I take your point there. But just the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, the narrative arc of this series is going to be about um, this kind of like martial, um, you know reclamation of the of the federation or not the federation but but starfleet and making it into this war carrying body the fact that a black woman is going to be the face of that i do find that yeah you know I, very troubling I completely agree with that yeah so. i mean we do you want to talk about that right now or you want to wait till we get to that part of the <laughs> yeah i mean because you know like, the it, things that i want to make sure that we cover are generally quite superficial i want to be honest with our listeners and let them know that after a rousing weekend at Geek Girl Con. <clears throat> we are real tired. We're real tired. Yeah. But, okay. So, like. So, make sure to hit me up at, at Ebony oh Aster. Oh, God. Here we go. And let me know what you think I've forgotten in okay. the course of this so episode. So, let's talk about big picture here. Because yeah. we were, you know, the first two episodes we took issue with. But we were mm -hmm. like, okay, well, let's see where it goes. Because it's clearly going to be different. She's going to be right. on a different ship with a different crew. And we're introduced to all of these new people. Mm -hmm. And also, we're introduced to the big picture story so far right. is that Lucius Malfoy right. is 
building, using spores to fly faster. Yes. Right? And so he I think that's what's happening. Basically. I mean, what, whatever. So there's that bullshit, like, look what bro can do with all the flashing, uh, like, environments right, that right. he put her through in that tube of yeah. spores or whatever. But, like, he picked her because mm -hmm. she thinks outside the box and she thinks outside the In a way that will win wars. Yes. In a way that is, like, aggressive and violent. And he liked that she wanted to mutiny. Mm -hmm. she li he liked that she wanted to shoot first. Yeah. Because Starfleet principles don't matter mm -hmm. uh, in this when you're at war. And we were reminded of this over and over. And he said, they gave me discretion to fight this war however I want. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sitting here being like, what happened to Star Trek? Yeah, exactly. No, this is not the Starfleet that I He literally wrong. says this is not a democracy at one point, too. Yeah. Well, and, you know, while we hear all of the other horrible things, including the lead up to the title of the episode, so <laughs> universal <laughs> law is for lackeys, context is for kings, and it was just like, well, apparently the laws don't apply to some people, rules don't apply to some people, yeah. you know? Uh, if you're going to behave in a diplomatic manner if you're gonna you know not shoot first and ask question later then that means you're a chump yeah. context is for kings you know it's so... coffee is for closers i've never heard that oh my god <laughs> hit me up at ebony aster and let me know you caught that reference i don't know our listeners okay so we met a lot of new people yes uh who who, who was your most interested person there's uh, there's sylvia tilly yep there's lieutenant paul there's that wait who is lieutenant woman. paul he's the dazed and confused guy he's the oh, Alan Tudyk? piece of shit <laughs> it wasn't alan he's like, tudyk he's like but, warped little brother yeah like he straight up looked just like alan tudyk anyways uh yeah no my favorite because i can tell already what they're gonna do with her is commander landry that was the one whose name i couldn't catch and so i had to go back and find out that's the chief of security did they say what her name was uh, yeah, oh, she I says totally it at the very beginning. That. Like, when she comes in and, like, strikes a pose and is like, bam, looks like we're gonna be hauling trash, I automatically was like, I love this bitch. Because she, <laughs> she's clearly gonna be set up to be highly antagonistic to Burnham, you know? And I love that of the two women of color that they've now got on staff, they're like, listen, we need to um, put these two against each other, right? I think some really shady shit is probably going to be said. I'm going to be horrified week on week. Oh, and as a reminder, I will continue watching this show just because I'm blown away by how messed up it is. It's so bad. Okay, so wait, what was her name again? Landry. Landry. So do you remember in, so um, Michael Burnham gets pinged to go on the, the, the sh when the show turned into Alien, right, randomly, right, right. Um, she got pinged to go there. And there's these shots of, um, oh my God, what's her name? <laughs> Landry? <laughs> Landry. Uh -huh. um, this ain't Friday Night Lights. What the hell right? is Landry shit? <laughs> Anyways, he, uh, she, so uh, when Alan. <laughs> Spit it out, Anita. Spit it out. When uh, Lieutenant Paul, Alan Tudyk's character, but not really him, mm -hmm. um, is doing that fucking. Do you think that guy doesn't get hired because he looks too much like Alan Tudyk? Maybe. But not enough like Alan Tudyk? <laughs> Maybe. I bet he does. Maybe. That yeah. could be his problem. Anyways, sorry to interrupt. It's all good. So he's doing that insufferable speech about why oh he God. started his career in science and blah, and I'm smart and fuck you and blah, blah, blah. And they kept shooting back to Landry's face. Mm -hmm. So it, like, and it looked almost sympathetic. And yeah. I kept waiting for like, oh, the next scene, there's going to be a thing that's like bonding them. Mm -hmm. But then there was nothing. And I was like, well, what was that creative choice? Like, why did you keep oh, shooting to her face? Like, what are those reactions? Because usually you use reaction right. shots for right. a reason. No, nothing. No. Nothing in this show makes There's sense. There's no logic. The, the show doesn't work on a narrative level. It doesn't work on a visual level. No. It doesn't work on a show running level. It Every don't work at all. When you think they're going to go left, they go right. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is that at the beginning, so um, uh, Michael gets uh, into a fight in the cafeteria. She does Seuss Mana. I like that. <laughs> Uh, Suze Manas, yeah. which was Vulcan martial arts, and I swear to God, I was so ready for her to say, I gave him the Vulcan hello. But she didn't. <laughs> you were for it. Opportunity missed. Yeah. 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 But so Landry says, um, you know, they're talking about how it's like, she's like, I was raised on Vulcan, blah, 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 yeah. whatever. And Landry's like, um, Vulcans should stick to logic. Yeah. 
And so you're like, oh, cool. The two women of color on this show are fucking racist. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Or alienist or whatever. Mm. Gotta be a word for that. <laughs> Speciesist. Speciesist. Yeah. No, absolutely. But uh, I think, first of all, the fact that, um, that Burnham was fostered on Vulcan, I think could be very cool, right? But the fact that the show shows such little imagination that the people who foster her on Vulcan are Sarek and his wife, Amanda. I'm like, there are other Vulcans people. Like, there are more than three Vulcans. No. Seriously. You know? And so I was just like, I don't know. I'm not with it, right? Um, so we're going to keep coming back to her history on Vulcan. And that's one thing that I do like about the show and that you and I have both talked about, um, how smart. Michael Burnham is, yeah. you know, I think like they could have gone away. Um, they could have made her just like strictly a physical badass um, and just made her like kind of aggressive and in your face, um, which would have been an even more catastrophic choice. But the fact that we show her um, or rather we see her being just incredibly sharp, very creative, um, you know, coming up with these just out of the box solutions. I actually really like. Yeah, I do too. Those are the moments that I'm like, oh, cool. Like, she, yeah. she's smart and she knows. What, and I'm enjoying that part of it. Mm -hmm. I don't, like, here's the thing. I don't, the acting isn't good. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. She's not that great. And he, part of it is that, like, they have nothing to work with. No, and so no. the, the problem, one of the problems for me is, so the, the scene that I think was the absolute worst was between um, Dazed and Confused Homeboy, Lieutenant mm -hmm. Paul, mm -hmm. and the conversation he had with the guy on the ship. I was, that oh, was, that was criminally bad. But every time Lucius Malfoy is on screen, mm -hmm. he is so fucking good, and mm -hmm. he knows how to work with crappy material yeah. that everyone else looks awful on the show. Yeah. Like, I think that, like, the act, everyone else's acting is so, his acting, I guess, dwarfs all the other acting? Is that, yeah, you, well, you know I what I mean? Like, no, I totally get what you're saying. Although, you know, my homeboy, Doug Jones, gonna give him a shout out. Sure, sure, Lieutenant sure. Lieutenant Surreal. Sure. He's good, also he's, good. he's good. But no, I think, like, Sonequa Martin-Green is better than the material that she's given. I think, you know, and I also think that the direction that she's being given um, is kind of all over the place, you know? Yeah. So there are these moments where we see, like, you know, emotion peeking through, and we she's given something to actually work with. Um, but I don't think that the, the kind of um, stoic direction that she's being given serves her or the story I agree. well. And I don't, yeah, like, I don't, I don't, um, I don't think I know her from anything else, but I do... I can see that she's probably not terrible. Mm -hmm. I just think that she's, this is not a good role for her. And right. this isn't like, I'm like, I keep, she's supposed to be stoic and Vulcan, but like, but I, it's, it's not but, landing. But, but I it's think, not landing for me. Well, no, because I think that the direction um, that they're taking her instead of, you know, stoicism um, is wooden, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. so it, like it's a, it's a, you know, complete kind of, like there's no affect at all there and it just, it doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, I agree. But, but I, I do think as we get further into the show, I'm hopeful here that we'll be able to get more from her as she interacts with more crew members, maybe. I think the, um, the relationship, I hope, that she develops with um, Sylvia Tilly? Tully? Yeah, Tilly. roommate. Yeah, is going to be good. <laughs> Although, what the hell was that? You know, like, Dude, I have special needs. And so, shit. hey, like, what year are we in? And this is how we're treating neuroatypical people? You know, like, isolating it's them? It's fucked up. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And also, <laughs> the explanation that I'm allergic to polyester... And it causes chronic snoring. So I have this bunk by myself. For real. Right. They can't fix chronic snoring. Right. And they, they can't deal with your allergies. Also, they still have polyester. That's what I'm the saying. What the fuck is wrong with them? It don't make any sense. And the, the Beatles reference. The, Beatle, yes. The Alice in Wonderland her reading a book that's like how many centuries old while she's fighting being, away from an alien. Yeah, the reference to her being a temp. Are there still temps? Yeah. And he even says, there's so much exposition. What did you call it? I called it Exposition Junction. It, it, it is was. straight up ridiculous. Him explain, uh, Lucius Malfoy explaining that, like, we we are now, like, we made fortune cookies back centuries ago. Girl, my family girl. My family made fortune cookies. And then 
world, the world got better and we have no more poverty, but it's going back to that time. If I was on that set, I would have knocked that bowl of fortune cookies <laughs> straight <laughs> when, into his face. My favorite part though, when he handed her the fortune or the, at the end, and I was like really hoping that they would break it like a, a wishbone, wishbone together. I know. Another that would opportunity have made it better. missed. Yeah, man. Yeah, opportunity missed. They got to get us in that writing room. They clearly. got a wooden bowl of fortune cookies <laughs> and they got a tribble on his back. They got a fucking tribble. What and was I that? Just, I just wanted to say I'm done. I'm I'm signing oh. off for the night. And yet, I'll be back next week. Why? Because Anita is making me do this podcast. Whatever. You're the one that was like, I'm going to I'm going to watch I it. I know. All. I'm totally lying. I'm trying uh, to make it sound better, but really I want to know where it goes. I want it to get better. I As know. another hardcore Star Trek fan reminded me today, um, the first season is always rough. And she's right. Okay. It's generally true. The first season can totally be real agree. rough. Totally 100% agree. Typically, it's not rough in a like shitty, like politically shitty way. Yeah. But. That's the thing that I'm not giving. I don't trust them. Like, mm -hmm. it can be rough acting wise. It can be rough. Like, you're still getting your footing. You're still trying mm -hmm. to build relationships between characters. Like, whatever. Like, some of my favorite shows have the worst first seasons ever. Yes. But this is rooted in, like, this is a war show. And it's yeah. making me think. So, we, you know, DS9 is not a show that I got into. Mm -hmm. Part of it is I think that Cisco was terrible on it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is why we can't record the podcast in the same room. Because <laughs> you're going to hit me right now? <laughs> because I just... You're going to throw shit at me? No, I just... I want to walk out. I want to have a very theatrical exit. Okay, well, we'll right just now. pretend that that happened. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll throw in a door slam yes, uh, please sound do. effect into this. But um, that was also a, a show about war, mm -hmm. right? And, like, I again, I didn't go all the way into it, but I know that that's what it's about, and that was part of... Part of the, like, the unappeal for me, the mm -hmm. disappeal, the whatever the fuck that word is. But, but, but no. this is, that, this, that's nothing in comparison to this. Like, this feels like, I don't know, like, it's kind of like, how dare you call this Star Trek? Right. No, but I think the difference is that th we're clearly supposed to be siding um, with the, the move to war, you know, and, like, we're supposed to be, you know, kind of stirred. Um, by like the the battle cries that we're gonna see, like it's it's a very pro war series. I don't think DS Nine was pro war. In fact, if anything, I think it was very anti war. I think it was like you saw um, like the horrifying and kind of devastating, grinding daily effects of it. And I think you yeah, know the yeah, fact yeah. that DS Nine started with like you know really reckoning with the occupation and like you know explicitly using that term. Um, you know, of, uh, of Bajor, like, I just think DS9 really wanted to, it, it wanted to say, um, if we are drawn in to a fight, you know, and there is no way out of it, you know, yes, we will, we will defend our people. Um, but, but it costs wasn't, are high. exactly. Yeah, and also the, the costs are high, but, but also war is never a good yeah. You know? Where this one is like, fuck yeah, war. Yeah. And, you know, here's the thing, too. We, uh, so, Brian Fuller was what was the showrunner. Mm -hmm. He wrote the first two episodes, mm -hmm. or that was his mastermind. Mm -hmm. And we had to, we, you know, my, my thing was, oh, well, maybe there'll be, um, maybe Michael is going to grapple with the fact that the, like, racism against mm -hmm. the, um, the Klingons, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But... As we're watching this episode, and I'm realizing, like, oh, these are different writers. Mm -hmm. This is a whole, probably an entirely different direction than what right. was envisioned. Right. I bet none of that shit's going to make it in there. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, the it could be very interesting, um, like, watching the, the Federation. Or excuse, I keep saying the Federation, but Starfleet and the Klingons, you know, um, sort of wrestle with each other in space. Like, that could have been very interesting. Yeah. But part of the trouble that we're having is the, the formulation of the Klingons, you know? So it's not the, the Klingons as them, in and of themselves were, were not the problem, although there's always going to be problematic aspects when you include them. But it's the way that they've been conceived. Having said that, I follow some really amazing people on Twitter and, um, you know, have heard and read some really interesting takes about the Klingon people who had an entirely different reaction than I did. People who actually found um, this, this latest version of the Klingons just incredibly thought-provoking and really challenging and interesting hmm. in a positive way. Um, uh, there was someone, and I'm blanking on her name, so I'll try and tweet it out so that, you know, she gets proper credit. 
um, but who was talking about how the fact that the Klingon language isn't subtitled um, on the show forces us to, you know, kind of see them as a people and, you know, um, it, it doesn't allow us for sort of to like kind of easily flatten them, you know, okay. you know, yeah. um, because we're, we're confronted with people who have clearly have a completely different mindset and culture and way of thinking uh, than we do. And there's going to be no easy access into that. Like we're going to have to work for it. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and Although, certainly wasn't something that I that I thought of. Yeah, that is really interesting. But I guess my response to that is depends on the audience mm -hmm. because the majority of the audience is I don't think is necessarily going to mm -hmm. uh interpret it that way mm -hmm. right like it's this is a CBS audience mm -hmm. I mean it is Star mm -hmm. Trek fans but like you know I just kept thinking as we're watching this like super pro-war thing I remember mm -hmm. so we didn't watch it with commercials this time but right. last week we did or mm -hmm. I did and yeah, you did too because we watched it on tv mm -hmm. but the um the all of the ads for the show we talked about yeah. this all the ads for the shows are like that like navy seals mm -hmm. and like just these super like pro military yeah. like pro like really like Surveillance toxic masculinity yeah. 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 yeah all this kind of stuff which is so the brand of cbs mm -hmm. so why would star trek be any different if this right. is what they're doing today right? right in this political climate and that's incredibly worrying so to me i keep thinking like well what I don't want to say the audience isn't sophisticated because that's not what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Like I, that the the mainstream or status mm -hmm. quo interpretation is going to be taking in all of the um, all of the tropes, all of the stereotypes, all mm -hmm. of the like the norms and biases that we have as a culture mm -hmm. and attach them to these people who are coded as brown. Mm -hmm. Right. They're brown, aggressive, violent, mm -hmm. the enemy. And if we now it's been made very clear that mm -hmm. we are in a ship full of like led by white people mm -hmm. um, that we are going to war and that it's cool that we're building new technologies. Right. And that's cool. Right. Well, what, what I found interesting about these alternative views of the Klingons was that it, it reminded me, speaking of audience, that in I have a tendency, you know, a really unfortunate tendency, sometimes to assume the worst of an audience, um, but also to assume a, maybe a more unified audience um, than in fact there is. So yes, there's definitely like the hardcore CBS audience that's that's going to be consuming the show, right? But there are going to be other people consuming it in different ways. And I think they have the potential to add to the cultural um, kind of conversation about them and maybe shift, you know, the ways in which things are spoken about and perhaps then shift what actually happens on the show. We know how responsive um, showrunners can be to, to fan reactions, right? So, you know, it, it was just, it was interesting to me because, you know, we came out of the first two episodes being like, not with it, you know? Like, here are 47 things I didn't like about this show. So to have people say like, whoa, you know, one of the things you didn't like, I actually really dug, forced me to, to you know, really step back and be like, okay, yeah, I can see how someone could have that, um, could, could take that, that view. I don't agree, but I, it, it was valuable to yeah. realize that. Well, <clears throat> I would say too, like that, if, you got me thinking a lot about audiences by mm -hmm. having that, saying that. So for me, a lot of my, like my personal work, uh, is rooted in what is the general status quo? And it mm -hmm. is really, um, it, it, uh, what's the word you used? You just said it about <clears throat> like unifying an mm -hmm. audience or assuming that an mm -hmm. audience is all the same. But for me, that's, I often do that in my work very mm -hmm. intentionally because I'm looking at what is the, like, what is the majority of people mm -hmm. watching this thinking? Right. And that's not to dismiss that there mm -hmm. are other takes and other audiences because, mm -hmm. of course, there is. Right. But there is also a status quo reading mm -hmm. of the way that the majority of people read right. it. And while I hope you're right, I think that, like, a lot of sort of casual viewers mm -hmm. that aren't plugged into a fandom necessarily, mm -hmm. they're not going to get that feedback. They're mm -hmm. not going to see that commentary mm -hmm. online or in articles or in like these little niche like mm -hmm. um, message boards or what have you. Mm -hmm. So I'm, you know, like is, I don't know. Like mm -hmm. I, I hope that there can be space for that, but I don't, mm -hmm. I historically that hasn't necessarily mm -hmm. been the case. 
Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, we just have to, we have to wait and see. But I do think that if there are a number of people who are responding to this version of the Klingons, then I think there's no way that we don't see more of them and that we don't, you know, that the showrunners, the producers don't try and give the people more of what they've been asking for. I think, you know, there's, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a space um, for that that I hope um, yeah. that, that they can take. And here's the thing, like the responses to this have been really mixed. Like mm -hmm. we, like we had conversations at Geek Girl Con this weekend with yeah. people who loved the show. Loved and I, it. And I was like, what? Could not believe it. Like, it was so I forward. thought they were shitting me. Yeah, but mm -hmm. people also loved the movie, the J.J. Abrams movies, and I fucking hated those too. So I like, loved the first one because it was what? so... I did, I did, and I feel no shame. For one yeah, thing, it was shouldn't. like, you know... Yeah, you're right, I shouldn't. And you know what, I don't, so good. No, you don't. But, um, like, but I love the first ones. The, the next three, garbage. Yeah, I hated the first one so much I couldn't watch the other ones. But, like, the point, you know... I think that a lot of Star Trek fans are just so excited that there's a new show and yeah. that it's it's hard to be critical when mm -hmm. you're just so excited about a thing. Yeah. And and that's I get that. I hopefully hopefully that like yeah. the be critical of the media you love thing will will come into play in mm -hmm. a little bit but you know, I, I don't know, like maybe we're in the minority right now of really hating this shit, but I'm like I watched this episode and I was we, so when you watch an episode together and you yeah. do a podcast together, you try not to talk during the episode because then you like burn right. burn the cast, so to speak. <laughs> but it was so hard not to talk through this whole yeah. thing and be yeah. like, "What the fuck is happening?" Seriously, seriously. It like he put her in like he, so he's like, "You're wrong. We're not building wep biological weapons. Let me show you what we're doing." And then they transport out of the captain's wing into the engineering wing of the same ship which i don't think i've ever really seen happen on a show before yeah. in that way and then he sticks her in a pod and we're talking about biological weapons so you're sitting here being like oh my god what are you gonna do to this woman right right and then like she's it's just it was so dumb well he <laughs> says like you know thing. i want to show you why you're wrong why we're not working on weapons let me lock you so, into a cell yeah so i'm gonna show you this thing oh <laughs> ha 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 it is actually gonna be an awesome weapon <laughs> You know, right. it has other uses, but we're really going to use it as oh a weapon. Oh, my God. It was like, it, oh, it was so dumb. It was so dumb. And then that shot of all of the, like, locations you could go with, like, the snap of a finger. And you're just like. It reminded me of that Next Generation episode. And I'm blanking on the name. So at me, at Ebony Aster. And remind me which episode Ebony. <laughs> it was. But where um, Picard, Data, and I think Jordy are in an away team. It's this, you know, um, like piece of alien tech that can immediately transport um, someone to any place in the universe, but it's random. You can't choose where it's going to be. Uh, and it looked like some of the same backdrops were used. It just seemed like a conscious shout out to that, that episode. Yeah, all right. I'm going to watch right. it as soon as we're done yeah. recording because it was great. I'm Tell me which one it is when you figure it out. Okay. You're going to be right. asleep in 20 minutes. That's true. I am. Um... Okay, can we talk, before we wrap up, yeah. I really like Saru. Me too. He's the only other one that I really like. And like, he says to her, <laughs> you were always a good officer until you weren't. So good. So good. No, when he said, I'm going to protect my captain better than you did. Yeah. Hello. Saru yeah. is not playing. I know. Saru And then when he's, like, when he's like, mutiny aside... She's the smartest Starfleet officer I've ever known. And like, oh my like, God, Doug Jones. Yeah, and part of me was like, oh my God, shut the fuck up. Like at this point in the show, I'm just like, I hate all of you. But I yeah. also was like, oh, like I already, I already want, I'm already building their relationship in mm -hmm. my brain of like being super bonded and tight. You yeah. Know? Like I want for, that. You know, join each other for breakfast, eat blueberries every morning. Oh yeah, blueberries. It's going to be a great time. All right, let's go get some blueberries. Let's go get some blueberries. I don't really like blueberries actually. Can we talk in next week's episode about how the tech seems weirdly too futuristic for what's supposed to come before Enterprise? Yeah, we can talk about that. Okay, let's talk about that next time. Sweet. All right, y'all. We're going to wrap this up. Thank you for joining us. We will be back next week for more hot takes. And <laughs> And you'll be asking yourself, why are you doing this to yourselves? Yeah. All right, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.